So the CIP Society prevents a variety of these Advantage Live webinars throughout the year. Uh, this one on automated vehicles was planned as part of a follow-up to the Emerging Issues Research Report that we published uh, two years ago. Uh, so the automated vehicles report that we published as part of our Emerging Issues Research Series was that year's report. We have since uh, also published a report on the sharing economy. The sharing economy report also addressed uh, mobility and um, the, the concepts of Uber and how an app like Uber is, is changing the way we move from place to place. And so we thought that it would be a really great opportunity now uh, in this, a year later since sharing economy and, a, and two years since automated vehicles, to bring back a couple of the people that we have been fortunate enough to have talk about these issues. Both Mark Francis and Vern Grush have presented for us previously. And we thought we'd ask them and pose the question of where are we now with some of these issues, knowing that automated vehicles is a big continuum that is not once and done but is certainly uh, long-standing uh, and depending on who you believe uh, something that's going to take 10 years or not in our lifetime so as we um, look at where we are with automated vehicles we thought that we could um, see that there obviously has been some transition and some evolution in both uh, how automation is improving the way our cars drive on the streets and highways, but also some implications for the likes of Uber and Lyft and automation in transit that has some really great implications for how we can just move from point A to point B. So the combination of, of Mark Francis and Bern Grush talking today uh, should be a really great conversation about automation and uh, mobility. So with that as a bit of a preamble, and looking like we've got a good majority of the people online, uh, we'll start with a couple of housekeeping issues. So the webinar is being recorded. Everyone who attends and anybody that registered who is not able to attend will receive a copy of the recording and a copy of the slides. Okay, so uh, if there seems like we're just um, covering off a few slides very quickly, you'll be able to go back and look at the information. Uh, we do have a question box on the side of your platform, so we do hope that you'll make the most of this by participating and asking questions uh, through the webinar and or certainly at the Q&A section that we'll have at the end of the webinar, okay? All right. So. Without further ado, let's have Mark introduce himself and start the presentation. Oh, and I'm going to give him control. He's got control. All right. Thank and you, Margaret. Uh, I'm grateful for the Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Margaret. So I'm uh, grateful for the opportunity to be uh, part of this uh, discussion. Uh, just briefly in terms of background. Um, I am responsible for uh, the vehicle registration licensing programs uh, in the province of, uh, of British Columbia, and I uh, also co-chair a national working group through the Canadian Council of Motor Transport Administrators on autonomous vehicles. And I've uh, been with ICBC for uh, about 31 years and uh, uh, have spent uh, some of the time in the insurance division as well. So. Getting started, uh, so I think everyone's tuned into the fact this is a, a rapidly evolving technology space and there's a, a critical foundational need to have a common, uh, consistent and clear language so that uh, those involved in the dialogue relating to the development and regulation of, of the technology can have effective and, and collaborative planning. So this would include vehicle manufacturers, uh, aftermarket tech developers, motor vehicle administrators, regulators, both at the federal and the provincial territorial levels, especially those involved in vehicle registration licensing and, and driver licensing, um, enforcement personnel and other first responders, the insurance industry, and pretty much all those uh, involved in transportation management. 
So a quick uh, recap, a summary of the uh, range of automated vehicle classification uh, developed by the uh, Society of Associated Engineers, which is now uh, commonly accepted and a consistency a consistently recognized uh, classification system by stakeholders. So as you'll see, there's an increasing reliance on the vehicle technology, uh, often referred to as the uh, ADS or automated driving system, as you move along the spectrum from the left to the right uh, to monitor the roadway environment for, for hazards and to control the performance of the vehicle, uh, the dynamic driving task, or also known as the DDT. And we're especially focused on level three and level four. Uh, level three, because this is where the driver can often uh, disengage, especially for long periods. And the concern is for cases where the driver might not retake control as readily or smoothly as needed. Uh, no one has uh, sufficient actual experience uh, with respect to this issue, that being the human uh, machine interface, to understand its, its risk profile. So the question on its effect on premiums is, is hard to resolve. It's also a significant concern to manufacturers as they want to minimize their exposure to risk through product liability as it relates to the transitioning back to driver control. And this transitioning period does create a bit of a gray area in terms of who is liable, uh, the tech product or the driver receiving or yielding uh, control. Uh, level four is important because uh, this class of vehicles does not necessarily require an onboard driver, and we have no actuarial experience here either. Also, uh, just as an aside, regulators are using the term HAV or highly automated vehicles and ADS or uh, automated driving system interchangeably, and they include levels three, four, and five only. So this leads us to the question of the current state of the technology. <clears throat> so since manufacturers have done pretty much all they can to minimize the risk and degree of injury, and in addition to reducing the chance of dying in the event of a crash, the foremost objective has become to stop the crash from happening in the first place. So we'll look at where we're at with both testing and deployment, and these phases are overlapping, uh, not consecutive. <clears throat> so the vast majority of testing uh, is occurring in the U.S., with a number of jurisdictions having approved testing with no one actually sitting behind the wheel in the driver's seat uh, during the testing. And these jurisdictions include California, Arizona, Massachusetts, and, and Nevada. So this slide contains an image of a Waymo, also known as Google, a level four vehicle testing in Arizona. Um, for anyone who's interested, you can search a Google self-driving car on YouTube and view any number of videos uh, demonstrating the testing and explaining the, the technology. Uh, Ontario is currently the only Canadian jurisdiction with an active testing program. Uh, however, Quebec is developing a program too and expects to announce its launch uh, later this summer. So there are about 50 companies actively testing in California. Um, the Ontario program has approved seven testing organizations. And in terms of the volume of testing by various organizations, Waymo has uh, logged about 5 million miles. Uh, Tesla has, ex has gained experience in the billions of miles through their autopilot technology. Uh, perhaps autopilot is a bit of a misleading term due to the sorts of crashes we've seen, and I'll talk uh, more about that shortly. There are also a number of uh, passenger transporting shuttles in some cities and university. Uh, this slide contains an image of the Navia shuttle currently deployed at the University of Michigan, and it moves students uh, across about a mile of its campus, and I had the a privilege of riding in it during testing last September uh, at M-City, uh, the university's 34-acre uh, automated vehicle, connected vehicle test site. There's also testing promises that relates to uh, first and last mile of transportation uh, management systems. So some early level three vehicles are actually now uh, available for purchase by the general public, including the Cadillac CT6 with its uh, Super Cruise technology system. You might've seen uh, commercials on TV for these vehicles intended for seating control to the vehicle under highway uh, driving conditions. And there are a number of others out there with varying conditions uh, of use. For example, the Mercedes technology allows vehicle control for up to 12 seconds at a time. Another example is the BMW 7 Series Active Driving Assist, but it requires uh, one hand on the wheel at all times. 
Another one I would describe as a subset of automated vehicle yeah. technology is uh, ADAS or ADAS uh, or Advanced Driver Assistance Systems. So just to complicate things further, a kind of a disruption amidst the AVCV disruption. So these systems run, rely on the same types of technology as automated vehicles, such as LiDAR, radar, image processing, but represent a, an incremental approach to high automation. Examples include uh, automatic emergency braking, adaptive cruise control, and automatic parking. But the most promising from a crash reduction perspective being the automatic emergency braking. <clears throat> and again, primary objective is to prevent uh, the crash in the first place. So as expected, there's been uh, some negative and positive stories. 49-year-old uh, Owen Herzberg was killed in a crash uh, with an Uber test vehicle in Tempe, Arizona on, on March 18th. Uh, technology suppliers uh, soon afterwards, including the LiDAR and computer graphics card maker uh, for the vehicle involved in that crash, did raise some questions regarding the appropriate activation and integration of the, of the technology. So the National Transportation Safety Board released its preliminary report into the crash a couple of weeks ago, and some key findings and excerpts include that uh, Uber had equipped the test vehicle with a developmental self-driving system. The system consisted of forward and side-facing cameras, radar, LIDAR, navigation sensors, and a computing and data storage unit integrated into the vehicle. Uber had also equipped the vehicle with an aftermarket camera system that was mounted in the windshield and rear window, and that provided additional front and, and rear videos, along with an inward-facing view of the vehicle operator. In total, 10 camera views were recorded over the course of the entire trip. So the vehicle was factory equipped with several advanced driver assistance functions by Volvo Cars, the original manufacturer. The system included a collision avoidance function with automatic emergency braking, uh, known as city safety, as well as functions for detecting driver alertness and, and road sign information. But all these Volvo functions are disabled when the test vehicle is operated in computer control, but are operational when the vehicle is operated in manual control. And at 1.3 seconds before impact, the self-driving system determined that an emergency braking maneuver was needed to mitigate a collision. Uh, according to Uber, emergency braking maneuvers are not enabled when the vehicle is under computer control to reduce the potential for erratic behavior. The vehicle operator, operator is relied on to intervene and take action. The system is not designed to alert the operator. So uh, well, that's quite telling, and I'm sure that this approach will be rethought after and a result of, uh, as a result of this tragedy. In fact, a recent study done by uh, AAA serving the American public confidence in ADS technology noted a st statistically significant decline likely attributable to this event. And there was also a fatal Tesla crash in Mountain View, California five days later on March 23rd. And Tesla said the driver's hands uh, were not detected on the steering wheel for the last six seconds leading up to the crash. The driver had a clear view of the concrete divider the vehicle collided with for at least five seconds or uh, 150 meters. Uh, other Tesla events <clears throat> include May 8th in Fort Lauderdale, where, where two high school seniors were killed, although first indications their autopilot was not engaged. Also, a Tesla struck a stationary fire engine in Utah earlier in May, and most recently on May 30th, a Tesla struck a parked police vehicle in Laguna Beach, California. But the, uh, the Who's Winning the Race article from Bloomberg News on May 7th of this year states that Waymo has run self-driving cars over 5 million road miles, as I previously mentioned, in 25 cities and done billions of miles in computer simulation, which it uses to update its self-driving software on a weekly basis. The Google-launched company has a fleet of Chrysler Pacifica minivans that can navigate city streets in San Francisco and reach full speed on highways. A pilot program of driverless vans will begin commercial service uh, later this year, picking up paying passengers in Phoenix branching out from there. Also, GM's Chevy Bolt can navigate the busy streets of San Francisco at speeds up to 25 miles an hour. And the Detroit automaker is so confident that it plans to run a ride-hailing pilot uh, next year in a car with no steering wheel or pedals, uh, something only Waymo has done in road testing. Also recently announced on April 12th is that effective May 1st, new Chinese regulations will permit self-driving vehicle testing on public roads across the country. 
the Chinese Ministry of Industry and Information Technology, Ministry of Public Security, and Ministry of Transport just recently jointly issued the Intelligent Connected Vehicle Road Test Management Standards Trial Notice, which introduces regulations for self-driving cars on public roads uh, nationwide. So, so Mark, just so a question on that because that was that was good. It felt a little quick, just so everybody understands. So the implications for the the Google car in Arizona, the outcome is that the technology does not incorporate a warning system. Is that kind of the the so that was the Uber that was the Uber vehicle actually Sorry? Not, yeah. not a Google vehicle, but okay. just based on the way they had configured the technology, uh, if the um, self-driving system was activated with the uh, uh, emergency braking maneuver, maneuver, it would have braked 1.3 seconds before it actually collided with the cyclist, but there was actually no uh, hmm. no braking that occurred before. It was up to the uh, the operator to uh, perform that task. So, you know, that's, um, so I, I, think, I think we'll see some changes in how Uber, uh, Uber tests. Well, and then, so that's my thought about you then went on to say all these other tests and all these other impl implementations, and we know that that needs to happen, and we know that that there's the balancing act between the lots of miles covered where there's been no accidents and then the unfortunate few accidents, but there's yeah, just a little yeah. bit of, and we don't, the progress needs to continue, so it's not necessarily that everybody's saying we got to stop this, the processes until we can figure it all out, because it's 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 machine learning all the way through the process but it just kind of seems like that might be a, a fundamental functional aspect that might need to be required that there is an alert system within the car's mechanism no yeah i think um well uber is going to probably have to make some changes in their uh, commitments to how they're testing but i also just want to point out that Google, with their more than five million miles, have had no uh, no serious crashes. I'm not aware of any injuries and certainly no fatalities in relation to their testing, which is far more expansive than the, than the Uber testing. So I just right. you know point yeah. that out. There's, there's a balance here. There, you know, just trying to show both sides, and it's really yeah. important to to get this the safe. Uh, safety aspect nailed down before we're, we're we're sort of deploying more more widely. Yeah, yeah. And so, are you saying that that like Google does have alert systems like that in place as opposed to Uber? Oh yeah, their vehicle yeah. Um, is uh, actively doing the driving and does have all of the systems active during its testing and has they've demonstrated a you know certainly a, appropriate yielding like I said there's many videos on the internet appropriate yielding to a cyclist pedestrians other vehicles there's one uh, video that shows a Google vehicle arrive at a a, a red light the light turns green <clears throat> the Google vehicle doesn't move a second or two later, another car traveling from its left just blows through a red light right wow. in front of it. And yeah. that, you know, so there's there's many uh, examples of, of very effective uh, uh, working of the of the technology. And that yeah. uh, the driver of that vehicle wouldn't have seen that that oncoming yeah. car, but the uh, you know the the lidar uh, can actually yeah. you know see through and around objects, so has that uh, uh, ability to see the stuff that we can't see. Yes. Well, and then even with the cyclist in Tempe, Arizona, um, I heard one report that said like not even, nobody could have stopped for that, right? Yeah, it was. Uh, there is some um, uh, video on uh, that uh, online that you can you can yeah. see, yeah. and the cyclist does sort of emerge uh, out mm -hmm. of a median and a very dark, unlit um, yeah. area. So it yeah. would have been very difficult. But you know, if the technology was activated, it would have sure. begun emergency braking 1.3 seconds before impact. It's just yeah. you know, the activation issue. So, yeah. Uh, and so, Mark, we've had a question uh, just to refer. So, Ontario has moved forward and, and has is allowing for testing on Ontario streets, correct? Yes, their program went live January 1st, 2017. Okay, and I was at a conference on automated vehicles in Ottawa 
and they're quite excited to be a center for AV on the streets in Ottawa. Uh, and we're talking that up at the conference I was at. Uh, yes, and then, the question is, Quebec is moving forward, but uh, any any um, activity in BC? You would think BC might be taking a lead there. No snow, uh, or little snow. No, there hasn't been. We, so we did have a, a change of government about a year ago, uh, ah. and uh, you know they haven't really turned their uh, their mind to this issue. So there hasn't been anything here. Manitoba did uh, make an announcement, I think around six months ago, uh, saying that they did intend uh, to develop a, a program, but uh, there's been nothing firm on that since then. But it's yeah. not surprising because they're you know beside Ontario. So if you want to see testing yeah. that occurs in multiple jurisdictions, that makes sense. Right. Okay, thanks, Mark. You can carry on with your presentation now. <laughs> okay, so one, one more slide before turning it over to to, uh, to Bern. I just okay. want to touch on some work that we're doing at a regulator level. So we're in the, the final stages of preparation of the guidance document for all Canadian Motor Vehicle Administrators through the CCMTA, the Canadian Council of Motor Transport Administrators. The document is called Canadian Jurisdictional Guidelines for the Safe Testing and Deployment of Highly Automated Vehicles. And it provides guidance on administrative considerations and governance. And an example of a recommendation in this uh, regard is that jurisdiction should establish uh, an ADS committee to address testing and deployment matters. And its membership should include a, a broad range of governmental and private sector stakeholders having an interest in and or responsibilities related to AVs. And a, and a lead agency should be identified to manage the committee. There are recommendations relating to vehicle credentialing broken up by testing and deployment. And topics include vehicle permitting and registration, license plates, uh, financial responsibility, you know, certainly uh, limits on, uh, on liability coverage uh, for testing. And, and Ontario has settled on the same as California, a $5 million limit, uh, uh, minimum limit. Uh, compliance of, uh, of ADS vehicles with the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Act. And with respect to driver licensing, topics include uh, ADS driver training for motor vehicle agency examiners, uh, driver education programs and private instructors, driver licensing skills testing with ADS vehicles, and endorsements and restrictions for deployed vehicles. And there are also some recommendations for law enforcement covering uh, topics such as uh, crash incident reporting, criminal activity, uh, establishing operational responsibility and law enforcement implications, uh, first responder safety, and vehicle response to emergency vehicles, manual traffic controls, and atypical uh, road conditions. So with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Vern. Thanks, Mark. And uh, I will now give control to Vern. Um, and you can take it over. Vern, you could introduce yourself, please. Thank you. Can everyone hear? So yes. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Margaret. And and thanks, Mark, as well. It was a great introduction, and um, uh, to some of the uh, technical progress and some of the regulatory uh, progress that's been made so far. Um, <clears throat> my name is Bern Grush, and I am um, with a couple of things. I'm with a company called Harmonized Mobility. I'm also with a company called Grush Nile Strategic. One is a think tank, and this is a software company. Um, they all do related work in transportation, all about um, autonomous vehicles and all about the future of autonomous vehicles. Uh, why I have this little drawing on my front page is that wherever we are now, whatever you think about where we are now, we're at, we're at some place that's somewhat optimized for what we have. Um, you may not like the way it's optimized, but nonetheless, <clears throat> we have the automobility that we have now. And we think we're going to some place, whether, and as Margaret pointed out, whether it's in in a few years or in the next century, we're going to somewhere where we're hoping to either have a lot more safety or a lot more convenience or a lot more shared vehicles or a lot more um, uh, uh, sort of tr transit oriented kind of uh, systems and so forth. So we're not, you know, we argue about where we're going, but this, this metaphor is really about we're going to get from where we are now to some other place in the future. And we're not exactly sure where that is. We don't know where that peak is. We don't know when it is. And we don't know what kind of difficulty we have to get through to get there. There's kind of like a little saddle between the little hill and the big hill. We don't know how deep that is. And we don't know how to get across that. So I'm going to talk about those things now um, 
in my talk. I need to learn how to, there it is, okay. Everything in my talk is from a book that's just been published a couple of days ago. You'll see that the book is really mostly about transportation systems and public policy planning. I'm not gonna talk a lot about public policy planning, but I am gonna talk about the things that are in front of us as this vehicle automation unfolds. And, and I, I like to ask a lot of questions. And you know, are most of us gonna buy vehicles, these new vehicles? And you saw when Mark showed, he showed some vehicles you know, from, uh, from a GM or, and, and others from Tesla, which are vehicles that people buy. And then you also saw um, uh, shuttles, uh, uh, first fast mile shuttles. These are people that, these are vehicles that people buy rides from. So what will the wor world look like in 20 or 40 years? Will be mostly, will we still own vehicles that are automated or will we, will we mostly be buying rides from robo taxis and so forth? We don't know the answer to that. <clears throat> and how fast will they come? And where will they come first? And what kind of changes have to happen as they come along? I'm gonna talk about a lot of those things. I'm especially gonna talk about what happens to congestion and parking and sprawl and transit and those sorts of things. And the reason to talk about all these things because if the world 30, 20 or 30 or 40 years from now is all robo taxis, that's one kind of insurance world. But if the world you know, 20 or 40 years from now is all personal vehicles, or predominantly personal vehicles, that's a very different kind of insurance world. Even if it's safer, they're still personal vehicles, there's still, still a very different sense of that property and, and what to do about insuring it. I'm not gonna give you the answer to it, but I'm gonna give you the ideas that we need to consider as we go toward that new place that's soon or far down the line. I wanna come back to this drawing first, this is, exactly what Mark showed you a, a few slides ago with various levels from the Society of Automation Engineering. And I'm only gonna focus on this first one called conditional automation and the second one called high automation. And the reason is, is that the, the, the difference between those two is the whole world of difference. So I'm gonna, instead of using all the terms driverless and self-driving and, and uh, autonomous and automated and all the various different terms that are being thrown around, I'm going to talk about market one. Market one is the market in which we sell cars to people. If we sell them a car, we wanna sell them insurance. And market two is the market in which we are gonna sell rides to people. It doesn't mean that the ride operators don't need insurance, I'm, I'm certain they do, but it's just not the same kind of insurance that we think about now when we buy um, uh, auto, uh, auto insurance currently today. <clears throat> so first of all, if you don't know this, I'll make it clear to you, vehicle automation is virtually inevitable. There is, there is about $100 billion invested already. There is an expectation that the market by 2050 will be something on the order of seven to $10 trillion, up from about a trillion dollars now. Why so much? Mostly because if we can, sell you rides instead of selling you cars. I can, I can optimize your attention and I can do so many more consumer activities with you while you're riding in my car than I could have if you had simply owned the car. So in other words, I can get my investment back more frequently and more often if I can sell you a ride and sell you a car. That's the, that's the concept. That's not proven, but that's the reason for that projection. There is an enormous amount of competition. It's an unstoppable amount of competition. This is the, the, the companies on the right, they are not all the companies involved in this. They're just the auto, they're just some of the auto manufacturers. But if you look underneath all the providers of all the technology that goes into this, there's literally five or 800 companies with massive investments in this already. I make the point that there's exaggerated promises and there are. You've been promised a lot of exaggerated things by all the players. And there is also a lot of uh, braggadocio from Silicon Valley in the sense that they're promising things with artificial intelligence that are far more difficult than they're letting on. One of the problems that Mark talked about with the Uber accident is because it's very hard to set a threshold for exactly when to break. For example, this, this sounds like a very simple problem, but if you set the threshold too low, in other words, <clears throat> 
if you set the threshold so that anything at all that looks suspicious, you hit the brakes, you'd be hitting the brake all the time. You'd be hitting the brake when the, when the wind blows the stop sign. You'd be hitting the brake in any movement of anything. You can't have that or you, would get, you wouldn't be able to ride in the vehicle. So you move that threshold up. And when you do that, you start considering some things that are in fact a risk as not being a risk. That's not why the Uber hit the pedestrian, but that is why some of the vehicles run into, uh, some of the vehicles have had accidents. And that is in fact why that very first accident happened where the car ran into a truck was because the thresholds were set wrong. So in, in any case, that, that competition is important. The technology is almost here. I mean, you can just see from Mark's talk that it's not completely here and I'm not telling you it's completely here. I'm telling you there's still a lot of hype about it, but I am saying it's coming. And th this, this point that I just made, that I'm making here on this slide is that market one, buying a car, all the car, uh, all the operators on the top there are mostly about selling a new car, including Tesla, they're about selling you cars. And market two, the ones on that bottom row are about selling you rides. So that's the car market and the ride market. It's not gonna come as fast as promised. There's a lot of edge cases. Mark already talked about some of them. Snow is a really hard edge case. They're not all solved. And you know, if you don't have, for example, if you don't have snow solved, what, what, how are you gonna put in massive robo fleets up north in, a, in, a, in a places where snow might be there two or three or four months of the year? It's also, and you just heard it, human acceptance is declining. Now it's been declining because of a couple of vaccines. It's not unexpected that it would decline. It will, it will bounce back. But right now, it's kind of a little bit on the downslide. There's a lot of things that need to be changed besides just fixing the uh, software and the vehicles. We humans have habits of how we own and use cars that are not the same as the habits that we would need if we were going to use robo taxis, for example. Um, there's just human habits that people like to drive. They don't necessarily even want automation and so forth. Um, we we'll also have to deploy these systems, especially these robo taxi systems, in, in an installed base of streets and roads and highways that are already in place that um, aren't really quite suited to this automation just yet. So it has to be adjusted at huge expense. Regulations aren't in place yet. How are we going to how are we going to have a world in which there's some vehicles without drivers and some vehicles with drivers? We already see what that problem looks like. That's going to be compounded and so forth. So there's we need to slow down our expectations about how fast this is going to happen. And the biggest issue, one thing is to get to automation. The biggest issue is really, will we stop buying cars and stop buying rides? Will we make this move from market one to market two? Absolutely unproven. So this is going to be a rough ride. Regulations are uh, lagging. Of course, adoption uh, itself is lagging. We talked about that already. I'm gonna to talk to you about why congestion will increase and why sprawl will increase. Things that, we, that we're that we kind of promising wouldn't happen, but they will. One of the reasons that we're gonna have a slowdown from the human side is something we call automation anxiety. Some of us are concerned about safety or privacy. Some of us wanna have control over our vehicle. We just don't feel like giving up control. The issue of access anxiety is until a vehicle can go everywhere, until this so-called full automation, the one that can go anywhere, anytime, any place, that vehicle is probably 2060 or 2075. So until that vehicle comes up, you're going to want to, if you're going to buy a vehicle, you're going to want to buy a vehicle that has the ability for you to take over. So you're not going to buy this vehicle that without a steering wheel until that vehicle can go everywhere. So it means that probably you're gonna still buy a vehicle for quite some time. I'm talking about 15 or 20 years. So here's something, this is really fascinating. There's, this, there's a company called Gartner and what they do is every year they look at all the new technologies and I'm talking about 80 or hundred of them. And they show where they are on this scale of just getting started or a lot of hype or uh, you know, really inflated expectations and, and so forth. So here's what has happened since 2010. This is how Gartner rated autonomous vehicles. They call them autonomous vehicles. I call them automated. It doesn't matter. This is how they rate. They said um, 2010, that this is more than 10 years away until it gets all the way to the right. This thing called the plateau of productivity means that this is solid, great, 
fantastic technology that's really working well. We know exactly what to do with it. In the meantime, we're inventing it over on positive hype. We're going to have all kinds of problems with negative hype, and we're going to be really disillusioned. And finally, we're going to figure out what to do. So these are the first six years. You'll see 2011 was missing because they didn't even rate it in 2011. But what do you think is going to happen next? What is going to happen in 2016 and 2017? Well, it's going to go down the slope. Of course, that's exactly how all technologies work. Except interestingly, Gartner sobered up and said, it's not five years away anymore. Those little blue dots said, in only five years. So in 2012, they were saying, by 2017, we are going to be solid. By 2015, they said, oh, by, by 2020, we're going to be solid. And in 2016 and 17, they said, well, by 2027, we're going to be solid. So the predictions are sliding backwards. Very, very important for your industry. There's a lot of hype going on. And the negative hype that set in that Mark described is actually having an impact on projections about when this technology is really going to be available. So here's the skepticism. Some people are saying it's going to happen now. People like Tesla and, and uh, GM, we're going to have it in a couple of years. They're calling it full automation. That's a misnomer. They're talking about level four. They're talking about robo taxes. Professors like Stephen Schlatterberg are saying it's never going to happen or it'll happen in 2075 and so forth. But that's so far away. We don't have to be around for those pre uh, predictions or I won't be anyway. So as we found out now that the recent accidents are reducing confidence, for example. So, you know, what the more likely outcome is going to be, and this is me projecting, is that we are on the verge of admitting that the problem, that the AI people are saying, you know, this problem is harder than we thought. There's a lot of people saying that now. So slow down. We're going to have this, we're going to have this, this on and off self-driving, this kind that I can turn on and off on my own. I can, I can buy a car that drives a lot for itself, but I'm not going to buy a car with no steering wheel. Uh, for a long, long time. So we're starting to recognize that. And what that means is that the robo taxi world is going to slow down. Well, it hasn't even started yet, but the projections, the predictions will slow down and the market one will keep up. Mark, remember, market one is the market you're going to insure as you currently insure vehicles. So what, what, what this means is that market one diffusion will slow down. It will be longer before the vehicle prices drop because of these uh, complexities that we can't get through. It's going to be a longer time in mixed traffic. It's going to slow down sprawl. Or it also it slows down the market two diffusion as well. So the whole thing is going to slow down on both sides of the equation. But it's going to slow down the market two faster than it slows down on market one. That's pretty important to know. It means that your business is not an immediate threat. I'm not saying it's not in threat, but it's not going to be an immediate threat in the next 20, 24 months or 36 months. It's going to be longer than that. Now, you're in an even safer place because really this technology is a sunshine, sunshine technology. AVs arrive from the south because there's no snow. You would never set up a four and 5,000 vehicle fleet. Waymo has already bought eight. 80,000 vehicles. All those 80,000 vehicles are going for the large part being deployed in the pink, deployed in the non snow zones. Um, so they will arrive in the snowy climates later, but basically what happens is they move from south to north. Of course, if you're in the southern hemisphere, it moves in the other direction, but it moves from the sun, from the no snow areas up to the snow areas, and it takes a while to get there. It, it's expected to be a 10 to 12 year. A 10 to 15 year gap lag. Um, I'm thinking it might be even sooner, but nonetheless, it's even worse in Canada, of course, because we're all in the snow belt up here. But if you look at the map, it says that Southern Ontario would be the first to go when they go. So it's, you know, keep your eyes open, watch things coming from the south to the north. Here it is in the south. This is, there's two villages called, both called villages, retirement communities in Florida. Now they, this, Jim Montevilli here is using the word self-driving, but what he's talking about is market two. He's talking about the robo-taxis. And what he's saying is, and by the way, this is the perfect place to do robo The roads are clear of snow. They're clear of potholes. They're all fairly calm roads, bicycle paths, all uh, uh, the same kind of development. There's no uh, traffic clots or anything like that. This is perfect for uh, automated vehicles, and that's where they're coming. 125,000 residents, apparently but by 2020. Again, hasn't happened yet, but here's what I think. It is going to happen. 
you know, it might take an extra year, but once this takes off, once this is proven, this will move like fire throughout retirement communities, throughout all those places where it's easy to deploy. Again, this is still market two. One of the things about robo taxis is that they are going to monetize congestion and sprawl. This is a really bizarre discovery. What happens is in the attention economy, your attention as a driver, as anything, doesn't matter what you do, that's of huge value. It's a value to surf, to purchase, to buy, to consume. If I can take your, if I can take the hands, take your hands off the wheel, take the wheel out of your car, I could have, just in Canada only, 66.7 billion hours of attention. It's an opportunity to capture. Well, what does that mean? That means that the robo taxi operators would exploit the fact that roads are slow and congested. I'm not saying they would they would create that on purpose, but that's actually a business opportunity. It's pretty scary stuff. Another thing a lot of people talk about is job change. Um, what's going to happen is job will, jobs will change as opposed to loss. There's many new kinds of jobs given by both market two and market one. As an example, if I can, if a person stops driving, he used to drive and starts to use robo taxis, that robo taxi creates a fraction of a new job because these cars have to be monitored. Uh, there has to be oversight, safety oversight, and so forth. Here's a study. I'm showing you this study to, to this is a little bit about, about uh, jobs not being lost. Again, this is a projection. There's no proof of this. Uh, what is, here's what the drawing is saying. It's saying that unemployment, the worst case unemployment due to AVs would increment about a quarter of a percent. Uh, and, the, and the best case it would increment unemployment by about 15% over what it would otherwise be. So if, you know, if employment was 5%, this would make a contribution of you know, 0.1%, that sort of thing. So, there is a, a lot of concern about job change. Now, that's a big deal. If you're if you're midway through your career, your job has changed. That that can be a wrenching change. I'm not saying it's not um, upsetting or not disruptive. I'm just saying it doesn't mean unemployment. It just means job change. Um, you know, if we if if there's a lot of uh, market one cars continue to be sold as as many expect, that would increase sprawl. Here's an instance of from the same study that showed the lack of the, the lack of job loss is saying that given automated vehicles that can help you drive, this is still, you would still own the vehicle and it would drive almost always for you. Then you can live further away and that gives you more job reach. So this is not a job killer. This is a job giver. It's the opposite, which is very interesting. So each one of these, and again, this is just a model. They're saying, oh, you could go twice as far. And if you can go twice as far, the area that you can travel in is four times greater. It gives you much greater job. It, what it does is it says that you can live way out, you can live much farther out of the city in the future than before and still get to work. That's, that's you know, basically what that's, promote, that would in this case promote sprawl. So what's going to happen when robo taxis cost the same as the bus, which is what's projected? We already see in many cities that Uber and Lyft, which are more expensive than a bus or a subway, are already starting to take ridership away from transit. If these robo taxis actually come out without drivers, they will cost the same as a bus or even less because these companies will compete and drive for the and uh, at a race for the bottom price wise, very threatening to transit. Um, you know, maybe threatening to uh, market one. It, you know, if these are cheap enough. And so that's, un, again, unproven, unknown. I have guesses, but we're not sure. So here's what the whole thing would look like. We're going to go through several phases. And these dates are kind of wildly spaced out dates. And the reason is because it happens quickly down south and it happens slowly up north. So it's, it's already happened in some southern states and in some warm countries. It's already it started a couple of years or it started this year, started last year. But this 2033 says it's going to start later up here. So that's why those that's why those those um, years are spread out like that. But you're going to go through an early stage. An early stage, obviously, is going to be 
a small number of vehicles. So there's going to be a small decline in non-automated vehicles and a rise in, in um, market one purchased partially automated vehicles. Well, it's, it's not hard to see that that's what would happen. So by definition, that starts out like that. And at some point, it gets really serious in this rising phase. And at some point, all the change that's going to happen happens. In other words, are we going to get, are we going to go to 10% robo taxis or 50% robo taxis? I don't know. 80% robo taxis. There's people that wish we would go 100%, and there's people that say no way. I would never do it. So there will be a plateau. The plateau will be different in each place. They will arrive at different times in each place, but there will be a plateau. So this is the kind of this is kind of what goes on. And I added this last one. This is the high automation becoming full automation. This is the market two ride buying. It looks like not very much, but I want to point out that that line, that bottom line, every one of those vehicles is doing seven to nine or 10 times more trips than the purple vehicles. So what's really happening if, if market two, if robo taxis take off is that we would come into a future Again, it's about mid-century where a predominance of the rides would be in robo-taxis. Again, I underscore it's unproven. But if it goes in that direction, that changes the market dramatically. I want to talk about something here called ECAN, which is why and how this market is going to be slowed down by how markets are taken up. Every product, every service goes through these four phases. At first, they're exclusive. Like a like the um, Tesla was ab absolutely exclusive vehicle a few years ago. They're now coming. You know, electric vehicles. You, you now have a choice. You you can you can now get a pretty decent electric vehicle from several manufacturers, but they're not really distributed everywhere. Uh, you know, first of all, the the power is not distributed everywhere, and you don't need an electric vehicle like you need it. You need a car, but you don't need an electric vehicle. So these four stages always go through. All the time. I'm going to skip all the words here, but there's an example. This has happened to smartphones. This has happened to water. This has happened to every technology and every service. Let's see what it does for the 20th century personal vehicle from 1900 to today. We've gone through these phases, very exclusive choice, access, and need. We are now entering uh, a phase of the personally automated vehicle. Where do the people come from that purchase those personally automated vehicles? Well, they come from the people that have been using and needing cars all along. So the people that bought those Teslas and the people that are buying these um, new Cadillacs and so forth, these are already automotive owners that are already your customers. That's who's going to go into this new ECAN. And over time, they'll move along to the point where they, you know, the population totally needs these new automated vehicles. Well, what about the robo taxi, they, it also has this, exactly the same thing. Where do those people come from that are going to use a robo taxi in the first 10 years? Well, they're going to come from people that are using the buses and the, and the Ubers and the bikes and the taxis today. They're not coming from your car owners. They're not taking your customers away at first because they're constrained as to where they can go. So you're safe from this perspective for a while. I don't know how long, but for a while. Here's an example just came out in a newsletter from a professor from Princeton who was complaining that the Uber vehicles that they've just uh, just announced they've gone however many hundred thousands of miles and they and in the in the art article from not Uber I apologize from Waymo the article from Waymo says oh you know somebody just hops in our hops in our robo taxi goes these are real robo taxis with no drivers that, that's they're in um, they're in uh, uh, Phoenix and so you know. Some student hops one to come home from school and Barbara and Jim are just zipping around. I guess kicking back means they were going for drinks or whatever. And here's what Kornhauser has to say. If they're not ride sharing, this is expensive, private, entitled privilege. In other words, the exclusive market that I just showed you for, for robo taxis has started. And that's what this is all about at first. It's not even for the masses of anything. It's certainly not for people that own cars. So here's where we are right now, today. Most of us in the developed world buy cars, and some of us buy rides. What's going to happen during the 2020s? Most of us are going to buy cars. Some of us are going to buy rides. But we're going to be buying these robo-rides instead of buses and taxis. No change. No change to your industry. What evidence do I have? That's how it's been working for the last 125 years. Here's what planners are hoping for. Hoping. I underscore hoping. 
that we're going to turn into massively ride buyers and very few of us are going to buy cars. There's no evidence for this. That's just what planners hope for. I hope too. You hope not. But there's no evidence for it. That's what's important. This is my second last slide. The world's split into two places. You're going to buy a vehicle or you're going to use rides. Now that ride using market is really the new difficulty. You're either going to use commercial fleets like the Ubers and Lyfts, or you're going to use public transit fleet services. Really? Which one are you going to use? This quote is from uh, Josepa Petrunic, who's one of the leaders in trans thinking in Canada. She says there's a war going on now between the automotive sector. This is the, this is the uh, Ford robo fleet and the GM robo fleet and the Ubers and Lyft robo fleets and the, the, actual the actual transit people who want to keep and operate these things on their own with those robo shuttles and so forth. How is this going to settle out? It's only going to work if they collaborate. I, I think they might. I think it's going to be very difficult. And as, as well as this goes, it threatens the buying the personal. In other words, if these entities collaborate and do a great, great job, that will eat into your personal vehicle market. If they do a lousy job, as they do now, they do a terrible job now. Well, they didn't start the automotive part, but the job they do for the last 50 years is so bad that people buy personal vehicles. If they continue to do that, the world doesn't change. Last slide. What is it that's going to move customers to market to? The only way you're going to move from owning a car to buying rides is if the experience of buying rides is preferable to the experience of owning a car. I would say, I don't know if anybody on this call that says that, the experience of owning, the experience of taking a taxi is superior to owning a car, unless you can't afford it. It's just the predominantly, the predominant preference is owning a car. That won't change unless something significant happens. It's not sufficient to just say, oh, they'll be cheaper. It's not enough. It helps, but it's not enough. You have to be able to rely on these all the time with comfort and security and, and uh, privacy and convenience that you need. So right now, my projection is that market one is safe, for, certainly for the coming decade, certainly north of the snow belt. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Vern. That was great. Um, there is, uh, just speaking of that uh, collaboration maybe between the, the commercial fleets and uh, transit, there is a city in Ontario, Innisfil. Uh, that uh, actually contracted with Uber to provide essentially their transit service because they were doing the pros and cons and the budgeting on how much it costs to bring in a new bus system versus enable the, their um, community to access small rides to where you know six or seven or eight of the key areas that people wanted to get from point A to point B. No, you're, uh, you're, absolutely, a, you're absolutely correct. Yeah. Um, I would say that's quite successful and it, and and I point out that what that did was that relieved the transit funding problem mm -hmm. and it took people that would have walked or biked or bus into uh, in this case Uber mm -hmm. or an, or a taxi also that taxi was involved but it doesn't it didn't take anybody from, it didn't move anybody from market one to market two. It just moved people from yeah. market two to market two. That's the point yeah. I'm making. Yeah. Because yeah. This, is, this is about what's, where's is insurance going? Yeah. Right? This talk, this, these, your, this audience is concerned where insurance is going, not concerned where sharing is going, except that I'm saying <laughs> that how, how, sharing, how sharing works out is going to come in and, and have an effect or not. Yeah. Okay, so now for a little bit more on insurance, we're going to go to back to Mark and have him finish up for us. Mark, you have controls. Okay, thanks, Margaret, and uh, and thanks, Vern. Very uh, <clears throat> interesting uh, evidence-based uh, analysis and and projections. So, so that's great. Um, so we're going to briefly talk about. Uh, insurance pricing, liability systems, uh, claims, and, and products. So I, I left off with some comments regarding the jurisdictional guidelines uh, being developed for motor vehicle administrators. <clears throat> and another one of the detailed recommendations was to, to begin tracking through a vehicle registration data element recorded at 
initial registration, whether a vehicle is, is ADS equipped and at which level, i.e. level three, four, or five. This will present the opportunity to provide a, a key source of data for actuaries. The Casualty Actuarial Society just released in April a report entitled Automated Vehicles and the Insurance Industry, a Pathway to Safety, the Case for Collaboration. The report emphasized the need for good, reliable data, and I pulled out a, a few key quotes. It's imperative for the various parties and stakeholders, manufacturers, technologists, policymakers, attorneys, risk managers, insurers, and actuaries, to cooperate during the development and rollout of AV technology <clears throat> and address collaboratively issues such as defining and collecting appropriate data, uh, considering potential liability systems, and establishing appropriate performance benchmarks by which to evaluate AV technologies. Clean, consistent data are essential to proper analytical evaluation, which is necessary in order to quantify the risks associated with AVs. So related to data, and I think one of the most important statements, currently it's very difficult and sometimes impossible for insurers to distinguish between vehicles with and without advanced technology. So unless this changes, improved performance will take even longer to be reflected in premium discounts. There are also comments about <clears throat> uh, premium inaccuracies delaying the introduction and uptake of the technology, which delays the benefits we'll see. So they agree that we need to work together to achieve the earliest safe introduction and adoption of the technology as, as possible. So turning to the subject of early pricing adoption, beginning with looking at existing practices or moves of insurance companies, uh, Aviva's announcement on November 28, 2016, they'll be offering a 15% uh, auto insurance discount for drivers of vehicles with automatic emergency braking. And on December 6, 2017, it was reported that a UK insurance company, Direct Line, is offering a discount to customers who use Tesla Autopilot to facilitate research into its effects and results. I haven't co come across any <clears throat> more recent announcements uh, than that. But our, our negligence-based liability system will be complicated with the emergence and inclusion of, of product liability as the question of ADS system performance may be brought into question in, in a crash scenario. So we'll begin with and have for quite a long time, as, as Bern uh, very succinctly pointed out, a, a mix of manually driven vehicles <clears throat> and vehicles operating in automated mode. It'll be further complicated by the scenarios of vehicles transitioning from or to automated mode. Now it's a question of which coverage will be responding, especially as it relates to vehicles where the manufacturer has said they will cover situations where the ADS fails. So litigation will be messy and, and costly as insurers and Manufacturers uh, will be drawn into liability disputes, probably be in for a little bit of a rough ride until some, some precedents get established. However, the technology also offers the prospect of more objective data, you know, black box type stuff, which will tell us exactly what the vehicle was doing at the time of a crash. And we won't be as reliant on uh, subjective information such as driver and witness statements. And that leads into the claims discussion regarding objective evidence with respect to fault determination. So eventually they should become easier to resolve from a liability perspective, but other questions relate to, to frequency and severity. So certainly one of the most promised road safety benefits touted by automation is fewer crashes. And the extreme end of the spectrum suggests that approximately 95% of crashes are a result of driver error. However, what will be the actual experience? <clears throat> As automation adoption increases, the, the crash rate should continue to decline, but with higher costs of the technology in vehicles, it's likely we'll see a, a severity increase. And we can see vehicle manufacturers write conditions of maintenance into purchase or lease contracts, and it may also be a, a condition of vehicle manufacturer liability, liability coverage in situations where the manufacturer says they'll provide cover when the vehicle is in automated mode. Could it then be a, a breach of coverage if the owner fails to maintain? Uh, for fleet-owned scenarios, it's likely there'll be a, a greater diligence uh, with completing required maintenance. There's also been a lot of talk about the unsatisfactorily low recall completion rate. Manufacturers are complaining that it's stuck at around 75% with a net result of uh, millions of vehicles on Canadian roads having outstanding recalls. <clears throat> so with increasing technology, it becomes even more important that recall repairs are, are completed to ensure the vehicle technology uh, performs as designed. 
And there's also an opportunity to come up with a simplification framework, uh, just going back briefly, uh, for settlements in relation to processing the claim, but then sorting out liability and who ultimately covers the cost later. So uh, turning uh, finally to product, there'll be challenges, changes, and opportunities here too. Uh, big data will be more readily available and cheaper through the technology improvements, making uh, UBI, usage-based insurance, uh, a more feasible proposition. We've covered the fact that a number of Vehicle manufacturers have said they will provide cover for crashes due to technical failure when in automated mode. <clears throat> and the migration towards changing ownership structure from owned to non-owned ride purchasing, uh, described by Byrne, uh, presents new opportunities. So for those who purchase rides, insurers may want to consider offering car share user personal coverage or a form of occupant coverage for added peace of mind. So while we know that taxis, Uber, and the like do have uh, coverage for occupants, which would be primary, this concept of occupant coverage would give uh, the insured peace of mind knowing exactly what they'd be covered for secondarily in the event of a primary uh, cover deficiencies. Lastly, there's a lot of concern in the AV space related to cybersecurity and privacy. And this could also uh, present new product and coverage opportunities. So uh, I'll end there, and uh, we may have some time for uh, questions or, or discussion. Margaret, back to you. Great, thanks, Mark. Uh, just to point out some of the um, aspects that uh, obviously Mark is talking about in terms of the expected collision frequencies or expected collision severities. There is a um, there are some graphs and charts on page 30 of our automated vehicles report that kind of uh, looks at um, when we anticipate the number of collisions and severity to make an impact on premiums and, and claims and the sweet spots more like about 2029 sort of thing. So there's some reference there. There's also a good infographic on the, the difference between the liability of the driver and the manufacturer. We've got the um, infographic on the inside back cover of the report as well so that you can easily access that. So still good content and information uh, in the automated vehicles report because it was such a comprehensive uh, report at that time. Uh, and then there's been updates from there. So just referencing that. The automated vehicles report is available on our website if you, if you haven't downloaded already. Uh, we do have some questions, so let me see. I'm just opening up. <laughs> and sorry, Angela, one of our guests is referencing, surely the vehicles will fly by then. Uh, I think when uh, Bern was referencing, you know, how long we have to wait for automated vehicles. <laughs> um, and we have a question about, uh, certainly in the context of automated vehicles, most of this conversation has been about cars and when we start to talk about mobility and so the robo taxis or the robo buses and transit uh, we're kind of talking about that we do know that uh, the broad spectrum of vehicles does include trucks we didn't really touch on trucks much but there is great um, expectations and we'll qualify expectations a la burn about whether we'll see some of those uh, great expectations of um, truck lanes and automation of trucks and a lot less Vehicle accidents involving trucks would be great. And curious about motorcycles. And oddly enough, I don't know whether motorcycles have ever entered into an automated vehicles discussion yet to date. Um, Mark, are are motorcycles uh, on the radar of uh, any of your automated conversations? I'm not sure that should be hands free. I don't know. Well, we're just quickly commenting on the on the. <laughs> no, yeah, just quickly commenting on the trucks aspect. So there's certainly some some testing going on in the U.S. of uh, of some uh, you know commercial tractors, um, uh, Mercedes, uh, Volvo, um, you know others are are in that space. And it looks like the you know the the primary opportunities is really in the um, the, the the part of the trip where it's sort of on on highway. So there's sort of the pickup of the load getting out of the city and then moving on to the next city where the load is going to be dropped off. That that area is where the primary opportunity 
uh, seems seems to be uh, occurring, and, and certainly given the you know the size of of those vehicles, um, <clears throat> you know there's there's uh, uh, op significant opportunity for uh, prevention of serious crashes, and you know we certainly think of the the Humboldt one comes to mind uh, recently. Uh, but um, in terms of motorcycles, no, I haven't seen um, uh, or heard of uh, any. Uh, real evidence or substantial comment on automation of motorcycles, uh, you know, just strikes me as just such a, well, not being a motorcycle enthusiast myself, but a cyclist, just a dangerous, uh, dangerous uh, method of, of transportation uh, anyway, but uh, no, no automation on that front yet. Okay. Um, Angela's asking about a, um, a short form that we used where I'm not quite sure in what context. BRT? Was that Burn or was that you, Mark? A BRT? Oh, that. Yeah, uh, BRT is bus rapid transit. There's light okay. rail transit, okay. uh, subway, bus rapid transit. Bus rapid transit are the buses that don't stop nearly as often. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and then Michelle's asked an interesting question, and we haven't talked about um, LG4 and LG5, and I'm not quite sure whether, Mark, you might be able to talk to that. So the question is about data storage. So in terms of the vehicle, you know, how much data is actually stored within the vehicle, um, how much technology is actually on the vehicle, um, or is it that the vehicle is streaming data uh, to the cloud or elsewhere. Mark, do you have an answer for some of that data? Yeah, so certainly there's a, a ton of data that is uh, being stored uh, on these vehicles. Uh, I think it's sort of in the neighborhood of terabytes for various lengths of, of trips. So it's being stored in the vehicle. But one of the big issues is is privacy and uh, access uh, to that data. Um, lots of, uh, of concern and discussion there. I think, um, you know, and who has access to it? Uh, certainly yep. it's uh, important for, uh, uh, you know, investigators to access it uh, to determine, uh, you know, a, fault of a, of a of a crash and you know what happened especially in the more serious accidents but yeah. um you know that's a, a a question that we don't have all the answers to yet and it's still um under under discussion but uh you know people are very concerned i mean there's potential really you know for the vehicle to to track your every movement so uh, people are going to going to want to have some control uh, over that um so that's uh, that's an active area of discussion um, and it's, it is stated in our automated vehicles report, the, the concern about whether um, there would be access granted for insurance purposes and whether that would be something where permission needs to be granted from the actual owner of the vehicle or whether it becomes a standard mandated policy that insurance has access to the black box, if you will. Uh, and so some of that's a big concern, too, in terms of relying on that data to actually assess whether the vehicle was in manual mode or whether it was in automated mode, all of that. So still a lot coming on that front. Um, and then the only other context that I've heard is that there is big anticipation of, of mobile networks and the forthcoming LG5 uh, that should be coming in like 2019 or so that starts to make it possible to have less hardware on the cars, as I understand it, and that it uh, starts to make it as as much technology as you have in the palm of your hand with your with your iPhone or cell phone starts to be a little bit easier in terms of the technology that's required on the car itself, which goes to a little bit of accidents and a little bit of how much needs to be repaired when there are accidents. So watch for a little of that. So at the moment, I think that I have seen all the questions, I hope. And so if there's no last questions, then it's my pleasure to thank both Bern and Mark for being here today.
and presenting on the latest implications of automated vehicles for both car owners and for ride sharers. So thank you, Mark. Thank you, Bern. You're welcome. Thank you. Yep, thanks. You're welcome. Pleasure, pleasure to be part of it. Thanks. And thanks for all attending. Bye Take for care. now. Bye-bye.